A special thank you to today's sponsor, Private Internet Access VPN. I've been saying for a while now that Tesla is taking a really big risk releasing the full self-driving beta to the broader public, but I actually might be wrong about that. Plus, I have very, very solid insider information on how to get 100% on your Tesla full self-driving score. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So first of all, I wanna start off by congratulating Tesla on a yet another record-breaking quarter. Quarter three numbers just came in, and I'm gonna read it off of here just to make sure I don't get this wrong. They built 237,823 cars, and they sold or delivered 241,300 cars. So that is absolutely astounding. Again, I believe that's a 17% or a 14% growth since the last quarter. So they actually have built over 600,000 cars this year, in the first nine months of this year, remember that they were just barely shy of 500,000 cars for the entire year last year. So that is pretty remarkable progress. I don't think there's any doubt that they will beat 800,000 cars delivered for the full year. They might approach 850,000 cars. It kind of depends on what happens in Texas and Berlin and whether they actually spit out any cars. And by the way, I'm going to be doing an episode all about Germany shortly. I have a friend um, who's a Patreon patron and has been giving me some inside information about the automotive industry and Tesla in particular and Tesla Giga Berlin and all of that stuff. So anyway, I'm going to wrap that all up and I'm going to do an episode about that. So if you have not subscribed, you should definitely subscribe to the channel so you'll catch that. So anyway, on to Tesla and risk and full self-driving beta, etc. Number one, I will start with a tweet. Someone asked Elon Musk yesterday if full self-driving beta 10.2, and Elon tweeted back, looking good. So I'm taking that as a really good sign that we're looking at this Friday, so only five days from when this video comes out to when I assume that there will start to be a wider release to like the first thousand lucky people. It's like, <laughs> it really is like Willy Wonka at this point. It's like, did you get the golden ticket? Did you get 100% on your driving record. So anyway, that's amazing stuff. And related to that, I want to talk about how Tesla's risk factor is actually an awful lot lower than what I thought it was. And that really has to do with what they're doing to prep for this beta thing. So essentially, as I'm sure many of you know, because you're driving the Tesla, you know, request button and you're getting graded at this point. And by the way, the Android version of the Tesla app is now over 4.1. I think it's 4.1.1 for both Android and a Apple iPhone at the same same time. Anyway, so it's something like that, but it's over 4.1. So anyway, I think everybody now has access to the little feedback thing, which is marvelous because I'm sure if you were driving using an Android phone, you were really feeling pretty left out, not knowing how well you were driving. But anyway, the risk factor that I was associating with rolling out the full self-driving beta to the broader public had to do with the fact that they have a couple of thousand very, very carefully selected people who have been doing beta testing, many of them since last, I think, December, January. Anyway, it's been quite a while. It's been a number of months since that has happened. They have certainly rolled it out to a few more people, Rob Maurer being one of those, uh, in a more recent time frame. But it's been incredibly limited how many people they've released it to at this point. And so the, the worry, of course, is as they go from 1,000 or 2,000 people to 100,000 or 200,000 people, that it's going to be incredibly dangerous for Tesla. Because you've got to remember, there's a couple things going on here. There's the public perception, right? So if there is ever an accident with the beta of full self-driving, it is going to make national headline news, maybe international headline news. It's insane. It's sort of like when Teslas catch fire. There's so few of them that it makes really, really big news, or if they wreck even when regular people are driving them or something. All of that seems to generate a massive amount of news, whereas any other car company, when something like that happens, nothing happens. So public perception is a really, really big part of that. The second part of it is, and probably more important long-term, is the regulatory aspects. So if Tesla is not careful, they're taking a huge risk that regulatory bodies like NHTSA will not allow Tesla to get you know, full self-driving level five approved for a very, very long time if bad things happen, right? So if there are accidents and if people are treating the software badly or they're treating the cars badly, they're using them in dangerous ways, all of that stuff means that Tesla would be delayed for potentially years until a lot of other people could catch up before they would get regulatory approval to be able to get full self-driving approved. So there's two things. The public perception is 
you know, probably for Tesla not as important, but it is an important thing. And the second part, and the much more important part, is the regulatory approval. That's super, super important. And it's really important that Tesla is able to get approved as quickly as is reasonable. And that means as quickly as they can prove that they are, let's say, 10 to 100 times safer than the average human driver. And by the way, if you haven't seen my video about averages, you should definitely check that out too. But anyway, I want to talk about how this is not as big a risk as I thought it was going to be due to the way that Tesla is rolling this whole thing out. And it has to do with this full self-driving insurance calculator, essentially. And what's going on is that they are only going to be releasing this at the beginning to people who have basically 100%. I think there will be enough people with 100% ratings that they will release it only to those people first, and then they will start working their way down. And I don't know, I, you know, I said I doubt that they would ever go below like 85. I think they might be able to stick to significantly higher than that. So what they're doing is they're taking the very, very top slice of the potential beta testing pool, right? It is not easy to get 100%. Let me tell you, because I've been driving it now for over a week and I've now sort of figured it out and the next part of the video is gonna talk about that. But it is not easy to do, it's not easy to game, you have to be very, very patient and all of that. And so anyone who is not really committed to making this thing work is not going to get a score that's high enough to get them into that early group of testers. So Tesla is basically mitigating their risk in a massive way by doing this insurance calculation you know, threshold and basically keeping people from getting the full self-driving beta unless they demonstrate that they are extremely careful drivers and also really good users of full self-driving like the autopilot that already exists. So those things together mean that Tesla is really mitigating their risk massively. Now, yes, there always could be a chance of accidents or something, but the people who are getting these high grades right now are exceptionally careful drivers. And so there are people who are going to be, if you're taking a risk, you can't do better than these people, right? They actually, to some extent, might be better than the people who are currently beta testing it because those people were not, they probably passed some sort of initial testing, but I doubt it was quite as rigorous as what's going on right now. So anyway, it's an interesting factor, but I believe that Tesla is making the risk as small as humanly or machinely possible right now. So I give them massive kudos for that, even though it is stressing me out entirely driving this thing around and trying not to mess up my score at all. We'll talk about how to improve your full self-driving score in just a minute, but first, Hey y'all, I'd like to take a minute to talk to you about Private Internet Access VPN, which is the sponsor for today's video. A VPN is all about privacy, security, and freedom, and Private Internet Access VPN is the best at all of these. If you don't want government entities or commercial entities snooping around your stuff, then you definitely want VPN, and PIA VPN is the best at this. They use open source software, so that means that everything's being examined by the open source community constantly, and so their security is at the very top of the game. You also want security for your data and for your browsing history. And Private Internet Access VPN never uses logs. They don't keep any logs of your access or anything that you've done. And this has been held up in court, so that's amazing. And finally, we all want freedom. We wanna be able to access data when we want it and where we want it. And Private Internet Access VPN gives you access to VPN servers all around the globe. So you can basically be in Canada or Europe or South Korea or anywhere else you'd like to be, all while using Private Internet Access VPN. And this gives you the ability to download content that you might not be able to get in your own home territory, and that's amazing. So with the best privacy through open source software, the best security, and the best freedom to access content anywhere you want, anytime you want, Private Internet Access VPN is the best. Check out the link in the description and see how you can save up to 83%. Heck, it ends up being less than a cup of coffee per month to protect your privacy, your security, and your freedom. What could be better? All right, so on to the other part of this video. How do you get a really good score in full self-driving? Well, it actually turns out that you can pretty much figure out exactly how to do this. The big one that really got me until actually today is the follow distance. So let me go through the five factors that are involved. Number one is disengagement. And that means that if Tesla's autopilot, if you're running it and you don't respond for a long time and it has to completely disengage the autopilot, that's really bad, don't do that. <laughs> that is totally simple to avoid. Just keep your hands on the wheel and jiggle it around once in a while. Like, absolutely don't do that. If you do that, I, you don't deserve to be driving the autopilot anyway. So that's the easiest one to completely avoid having a problem with. The second and third ones are aggressive braking and aggressive turning. And what those mean is like, you know, you come up to the red light and you slam the brakes on and you slow the car down really, really fast. You're gonna get really bad dings for that. Also, if you're at a light and the light turns green and you're like, vroom, and you turn out really, really fast. It turns out that these measurements are very sensitive. 
basically I found that if I press the brake hard at all, it's a problem. I have it on, you know, the heavy regen, so it actually slows itself down to a stop when I take my foot off the gas. And I don't even take my foot off the, the accelerator pedal completely all at once. I kind of slowly do it so that everything is very, very slow and smooth. When I start, it must really piss off the people behind me because I'm like, me, you know, I won't go over 10 to 12 miles per hour making a turn so that, you know, you're not pulling any kind of sideways G's. So those two are relatively straightforward. Just drive super, super gently, like, you know, like your grandma or something. Then there is the dreaded forward collision avoidance warning, right? I've had that happen to me three times, actually. I, and all three of them were completely spurious. Fortunately, the last time it happened, I was on autopilot, and so I didn't get any ding for that, so that was good to find out. I was driving down a completely open road on a straight line, and all of a sudden it started going like, collision warning, collision warning. There was nothing around. It didn't even break. It just flashed the warning a bunch of times and kept on going. So thankfully, I was like super stressed out because I thought, oh no, I'm going to get dinged for it. But fortunately, since it was on autopilot, no problem at all. Uh, the two other times it happened were on the exact same stretch of road. So basically what I've done is it's right near my house, but I found a back way to go around and so I've completely avoided that and I've avoided that problem. Essentially what happens is people change lanes really, really rapidly there. And if you're kind of in a lane and a person goes into your lane or gets out of your lane, but not quite fast enough, those were the two times that I had collision warnings before. It had, there was no chance at all of a collision, but it was, you know, <laughs> it seems like they've got it set to a very, very sensitive level at this point. So anyway, the deal is number one, avoid streets where you think that might be a problem if you possibly can. And number two is to just, give a really, really big cushion, especially, you just have to keep an eye out. If it looks like anybody's gonna be a dummy, then just, you know, slow down and get out of the way and let them do their thing. So you, a lot of patience involved, which is not my strong suit in terms of driving, but such is life. So anyway, don't have a, a forced disengagement. That would be really, really bad. You're not gonna get full self-driving in that case. Number two, aggressive turning and aggressive braking. Just do everything super smoothly. And as far as collision warnings, just try to keep a really, really big buffer, especially in it seems like relatively slow city traffic is when I've had the most problems with that, except for the one that was on autopilot, but I have no idea what that was about. There was nothing around at all. So that leaves unsafe follow distance. And this was driving me nuts because I had like one day where it said I had over 50% of my drive was unsafe follow distance. And I was like, what the heck? But anyway, so I was putting it on autopilot as soon as I got over 50 miles an hour because it doesn't count the unsafe follow distance until you're going over 50 miles an hour or about 80 kilometers an hour. So anyway, so anything below that, I was mostly driving my Myself. Anything above it, I automatically put on autopilot. Well, it turned out the problem with that is that when you're on autopilot, you, everything is by miles, right? So basically the unsafe follow distance is if you're within one second uh, behind the person in front of you. And it doesn't count anything more than three seconds behind the person in front of you. So it doesn't matter if you're driving on an empty highway all by yourself, you get no, you know, credit for doing that in terms of unsafe follow distance. So you have to be between one second and three seconds. And obviously the faster you go, the longer that distance becomes. I literally drive down the road now and look at signposts and things like that and start counting. I go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and I try to stay right at two seconds behind the person so I have a little bit of buffer. But anyway, what I'd done was I'd, you know, I'd gone over that stuff and what had happened was I disengaged the autopilot a few times and that's another thing that I've learned, never disengage the autopilot. It feels scary as hell to let it run sometimes, but you should never disengage it. Just leave it running the whole time until you can dial the speed down to below 50 miles an hour. So I actually manually dial the speed down to like 45 as I'm getting off the exit and then disengage the autopilot and then it's cool. So all that stuff is good. I've been getting hundreds just flat out all the time, but I couldn't get my unsafe follow distance down. And it turns out that when you're on autopilot, you get no credit for the unsafe follow distance. So you have to manually drive the car. So today for about 10 miles on the highway, I manually drove the car. I got behind somebody who was doing like five miles an hour below the speed limit. So I figured nobody would pull in in front of me and it's, you know, it's a Sunday, so it's a relatively chill day and I just followed that person and just literally counted. I was counting 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 and making sure I was staying as close to two seconds as I could. And lo and behold, I'd been at 16.4% unsafe follow distance just period. It was never giving me any improvement to that. The 10 miles that I drove today knocked it down to 5% immediately. So it, it that was like the thing. I had one little yellow thing. Everything else was green and looking great, but that was the one yellow and that popped it up to green. So basically if I go 
out and drive another 10 miles or something like that, it should knock it down to maybe three or 4%, right? So it'll continue to decrease. It's kind of stressful, right? Because you have to make sure that you maintain that exact distance. It's probably not a great idea to try to do this in very heavy traffic. In that case, I would just say, leave it in autopilot and let it be. But if you have opportunities, that's the way to reduce it. So it will not reduce when you're in autopilot. It just stays at whatever percent you were. So that kind of sucks. But if you're driving, you just have to drive as carefully as you can. I suggest getting behind somebody slow on a Sunday or something or a Saturday when you have the time off and there's not that much traffic and just drive behind that person for a while and then check your score again, right? So you can keep checking it. And what you should see is it should drop really, really fast. So anyway, that's basically how you do all of this stuff. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You have to leave really big cushions. You have to slow down. You have to turn very, very gently. And you have to, <laughs> if you get unsafe follow distance, if you, if you haven't had a problem with it so far, just leave it in autopilot. Because if you're not having an issue with it, you're not gonna gain any problems. It's not gonna give you problems if you're in autopilot over 50. But basically, whenever the traffic is hairy or anything and I'm going over 50 miles an hour, I put it in autopilot so that it's dealing with it and I don't have to. But from now on, after today, after discovering how rapidly I can reduce that percentage of time, I'm now going to, on days where I can see that I can follow somebody for a few miles manually, I'm gonna put it in manual and I'm just gonna stay that far away. So I should get my score creeping up. It still says 98%, even though everything is green now, but I think I should fairly rapidly be able to get up to 99%. I don't know about 100 before next Friday, but anyway, fingers crossed. For, for quite a while, I've, I think I've got either 10 or 12 drives now that are all at 100% in a row. So I've clearly figured out the way to do it. It just requires a lot of concentration. It's quite amazing. So anyway, that circles back to Tesla and their whole risk thing, right? They're not taking that much risk because if I'm learning how to drive this carefully in order to get the beta software, you better believe I'm going to have learned and I'm going to be extremely careful with the beta software. So all of this stuff is going to relate to itself. And Tesla, I really believe, even though I thought for a long time that they were taking a really, really big risk releasing the beta, I actually am rescinding that opinion. And I believe that when they release 10.2 and they give it to more people, that they're going to be giving it to people who are exceptionally careful drivers, or at least can be exceptionally careful drivers and that is going to allow them to have this full self-driving rollout without too much of an incident. And of course, they also have the right at any point to take that beta software back, right? If you drive like an idiot, so you're like, oh, I drove super careful and now I'm gonna go to sleep in the back seat and let the thing drive. No, they'll take it away from you right away. So they're gonna maintain strict control over this and I think it's actually going to work very well. So kudos to Tesla, very nice job. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting. If you did, please like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate appreciate it. It's been pretty amazing. And like I said, the episode on Germany is coming out soon. And that's thanks to a Patreon patron. So thank you. And if you want to join the fun, click on the link in the description and check it out. And if you're interested in some awesome merch, check out the link in the description. We've got the Tesla bot t-shirt, which is super popular these days. Don't mess with Tesla. Lots of other t-shirts, tumblers, mugs, etc. So check out the link in the description and help the channel out. And of course, thank you so much to Private Internet Access VPN for sponsoring today's show. You can check out their link in the description as well. As always feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye bye.